All right, welcome. Welcome to a podcast style video. Figured I would do this today because it's early in the season and lots of stuff coming in, lots of questions coming in over pre-emergence. And so I figured I'd do a podcast style. I'm filming this here in our new, my new podcast studio here in Lakewood Ranch. It's the new office opened up. And uh, people are asking, when is the podcast going to come back? I've got a pretty big project I'm working on that's due here in March. So once we get past that, I'm going to fire the podcast up again, but I figured I would do this podcast style video just to answer tons of questions. Look at all these about pre-emergence. And so if you're somebody that is looking to just put this on as a podcast, you can do that. And I may even release the audio through the podcast network anyway, just so uh, folks can uh, listen to it there because I'm just answering tons of questions here. So, uh, but before I get into that, I did, I don't know about you guys, but there's a big thing that's going around. It may be um, on the backside of it now, but everybody's talking about sea shanties and listening to them. I am addicted to them. I love listening to them. And I decided I would write one for you guys here in the spring. So I hope you enjoy this. I'm uh, doing this in our mostly empty warehouse because I get a little echo and I hope that'll cover up my uh, terrible voice. But if you enjoy this, give it a thumbs up. Ready? There once was a man in Indiana Walked his lawn with a video camera Filmed his grass all night and day Till winter shut him down Soon may the springtime come I long to hear those mowers run Gray skies leave and the sun comes out It's time to enjoy the mow He's prayed all day and he prayed all night Through Milo like a beast Ten days passed and his lawn turned green The best from west to east Soon may the springtime come, I long to hear those mowers run. Gray skies leave and the sun comes out, it's time to enjoy the mow. The years went on in his homeland called warm season, turf to love. To the sunshine state he drove all night, engaged in a new fight, a tougher, tougher plight. Soon may the springtime come, I long to hear those mowers run. Gray skies leave and the sun comes out, it's time to enjoy the mow. Now he squirts his fur all year round and loves his chubby St. Aug. But he can't forget about his friends up north in the snow, they have to fall. Soon may the springtime come, I long to hear those mowers run. Gray skies leave and the sun comes out, it's time to enjoy the mow. Soon will the crabgrass come, pre-emergent is your next chore, son. So temps rise, you'll be throwing down, so click the link below. <laughs> All right, there you go. Now I know I'm not the greatest singer in the world, but I think, I hope that uh, was brighten your day. If you like it, please give this video a thumbs up. So I was talking to John Perry and he said that he may even write some music for that so we can make it a little bit more robust. What I really need too are some uh, harmony singers to cover up my terrible voice, but <laughs> hope you appreciated that. So, all right, let's get into pre-emergence. So let me explain a little bit about the strategy and what pre-emergence are here first, just kind of set some tone and set the context here. And then we'll get into some of these questions. I don't know if I'll get to all of them. This is only a small portion that I got. And uh, this would probably be enough to make the video like two hours. So we'll see how we go. But all right. So there's two kinds of herbicides that we use or two ways we kill weeds. There's pre-emergent herbicides and post-emergence. Post-emergence are ones that you use after the weeds have already come up. Hence the word post-emergent. You spray it on the weed, it kills it. Then there are pre-emergent herbicides that you put down prior to weeds coming up. Hence the name pre-emergence. And that's what we're talking about here. We want to get these products down and in the lawn prior to to the weeds, seeds germinating so we can stop them from ever appearing. It's playing defense and it's very important because the primary weed, it's a grassy weed that we're targeting in the spring is crabgrass and all of you have heard about it. And crabgrass is an annual grassy weed and it will cause major bare areas in your lawn. It will outcompete your good grass no matter if you have Bermuda or Zoysia or up north, if you have Kentucky bluegrass or rye, it will outcompete in many cases. So you don't want it in your lawn. So we put down a pre-emergent product to stop it from coming into the grass or coming into our lawns, okay? The uh, product that we use is an active ingredient and it is called prodiamine. Now, prodiamine has been around for many years and it was under a brand name called Barricade. So the way these products work is um, they work like pharmaceutical drugs. A company uh, develops the, the active ingredient, they test it, they make sure it, it's effective and they get it registered and licensed, and then they have a patent on that for however many years they have it. And I think it was Bayer Environmental, or Bayer are the ones that patented Prodiamine many years ago, and they called it Barricade. So that's the brand name that you still may see out there is Barricade, but that's a brand name, and the active ingredient in Barricade is Prodiamine. And now 
Many years later, that patent has worn off, so you don't have to pay for the expensive brand name barricade. You can buy the generic. You can just buy Prodiamine, and there's a lots of formulations. There are lots of folks that sell Prodiamine, including us. So if you need Prodiamine pre-emergent, you can click the links below. You can get it in granular or WDG to mix in water and spray as a liquid. So that is the product that we use. It's the gold standard. It works for all grass types, north, south, east to west. And uh, it's the least expensive as well, or not the necessarily least expensive. It is le less expensive than some other newer chemistries or newer products. And again, the main target we use it for is crabgrass, and it works just fine. Now, when do we put it down? Well, we put it down in the spring, and there are two kind of, um, there's like a window or a target that you want to hit. You want to get it down again before the crabgrass seeds germinate. Now, we know that, or I know, or science tells us that crabgrass seeds germinate as soil temperatures are around 55 degrees. That's the opening of the window. Um, from there, it's like anything, like farmers, they know when their seeds germinate, right? That the soil temperatures kind of rule when it comes to growing crops. In this case, we're not growing a crop. We're trying to stop a crop, a crop of crabgrass. And so we know that, uh, that crabgrass germinates as soil temperatures approach 55 or hit 55. Now, there's one thing I want to say here. It isn't like all of the thousands of crabgrass seeds in your lawn germinate immediately as soil temperatures hit 55. It doesn't work that way. They're living things like anything. Some, you know, if you have kids, some are very early bloomers and some have developmental delays, right? It, it's that way. Some, and it, it's that same thing with any living thing. They don't all happen at the same time. The other thing with crabgrass seeds, some might be at the top layer of soil where it gets warmer faster. Some might be deeper down. Some might be closer to concrete where heat radiates off. Some might be in an area that's shaded partially during the day and therefore they don't, uh, the, the soil doesn't heat up as much there. There's a lot of different reasons. Some could get more water or less, but 55 is when that they are eligible to start. So we do an application of prodiamine as soil temperatures, soil, and I keep saying soil temperatures, not outside temperatures. As soil temperatures cross 50 heading to 55, we put down an application of prodiamine. Then we do a second one to hedge against those bets. It's called the split application. And the way crabgrass works is that if 55 is the opening of the window for germination, 80 is the close. Once the soil temperatures get past 80, there's like an environmental stoppage or an environmental trigger that says, okay, you don't germinate now. It's too hot. If you came up now as you're young and tender, you would die. It's too hot. So it stops. So the closing of the window is about 80. And so you want to make sure you have good coverage from 55 to 80. So we do a second application of prodiamine as soil temperatures cross 65 heading to 70. That's the split app. One as they cross, cross 50 heading to 55, and the other as they cross 65 heading to 70. Those are the two applications. That's the split application, and that will give you coverage during the window where crabgrass is eligible to germinate. Now, if you want to know how do you know what your soil temperature is, there's a couple ways. I'll put a link description below to a website called the Greencast, Greencast Online. You can put in your zip code there, and you can get your current soil temperature as well as you can go back over the years and look at historical soil temps to understand when your temperatures in your soil typically hit 50 to 55. That's the first way. The second way is you can get our free app. I'll link that below and that will give you the soil temperature actually down to your actual house. If you put in your, um, your actual address, we'll give you the soil temperature right down to your home. Uh, we use the same technology that farmers use. It's really cool. Um, or you can just put in your zip and get your city average. If you don't want to put that in, whatever you can use the app. Let me say something about the app though, real quick. Right now, if you log in, there is a program in there um, not right now, but the, the app is also a program. It'll tell you, throw down now, throw down now. And in fact, as your soil temperatures cross that 50 heading to 55, it'll ping you and go, boop, time to time to throw down per diamine. It's, it's, it's built that way, that logic. However, we are revamping the program. We're revamping the logic. We're making it much smarter, much more dynamic, much more custom based on how you kind of move through the year. It's going to um, uh, dynamically update and change as you move through the year because some of you go faster, some of you go slower. So it's going to have that algorithm built in to know that, that that kind of, I don't want to use the word AI, but it's going to have that, <clears throat> that smarts. And so uh, we are right now redoing that. So when you go into the app, it'll just say, please be patient. We're redoing the program. We plan to roll out the new updated dynamic program by the end of next week or early the week after. So for sure it's coming, just be patient, but you can get your, the soil temp still work in there. The journal still works. You won't lose any of your data. You can also set up future reminders for yourself. Let's say you're somebody that has fungus every year. You can set up a reminder for like May 31st, hey, time to throw down fungicide. You can do all that and it'll ping you as well as there's a FERC calculator in there. Uh, lots of cool stuff. So that's how you find your soil temperature and that's how you know when to throw down. So basically for those of you that don't want to have to look for anything, get the app and it'll just tell you when. It literally will tell you. So there you go. That is the pre-emergent strategy and that is how you go about it. Now we're going to go into some questions that we got and we're going to start here 
with David W. David's in Corpus Christi, Texas, and he says, hey, Alan, here's my question. What does a person in my situation do when it comes time to put down pre-emergent at the beginning of the year? I am in South Texas right on the coast, and my soil temps maybe dropped to 55 only a couple of times. I was afraid to put it down because we can get cold, but this year it just didn't happen. I sprayed prodiamine on February 5th, and the soil temps were 69. Was this a waste of my money? Good question, Dave. So uh, we're starting here warm season, and think about this. We are at, he's in Corpus, so he is at the extreme southern end of the country, right? Now, Florida is further south, but it's the same. We're year-round, basically. Uh, South Texas, probably coastal, anywhere in the Gulf Coast states, if you're right along the water there down into Florida, we're pretty much year round. So you never waste putting down pre-emergent. Um, I recommend for if you have St. Augustine grass, zoysia, or centipede that you use um, Scott's Bonus S, or if you're in Florida, you can use the Sunnyland Weed and Feed for St. Augustine that has atrazine in it. Atrazine, and by the way, people will say, Alan, never recommend store-bought products. Well, here it is right at the front of the video. I'm recommending a store-bought product. Imagine that, huh? Over about her. But um, those weed and feeds, the Scott's Bonus S and the Sunnyland, they have atrazine in there. Atrazine is a pre- and post-emergent in those grass types. So I actually recommend you use that during the winter. Um, they do have some fertilizer in there. That's fine. We're, our grass is growing very slow right now, so it's going to take the nutrients in just in a nice way, a nice manner, and stay nice green without pushing any surge growth. But you're going to get that atrazine in there, which can kill a bunch of the weeds on top, but also acts as a pre-emergent for 30 days or so. That's typically what I recommend in warm season turf. Well, St. Augustine, Zoysia, and Centipede, during the winter, right, like right now. But it's okay that you put the prodiamine down. Just You can still put atrazine down in a month or whatever. You don't want to put down those atrazine weed and feeds after t soil temps are over 85. So, David, just get one of those apps down in another month or so and then do another prodiamine in a couple months. Probably not the best question for me to start this off with because it's a little confusing. When you're year-round, you're year-round, man. You're just always putting down some pre-emergent whenever you're below 80. Um, so don't mean to confuse you all, but... But yeah, not the best one for me to start with. But I think I answered David's question there. You didn't waste anything, bro. You're all good. Okay, let's go to Mark. And Mark is in New Jersey. In northern New Jersey, if I plan to use the split app strategy for pre-emergent that worked so well for me last season, but I also have a few thin spots that I may not want to hit because I want to seed those areas, what's a good strategy? Do I try to avoid those spots altogether or should I just scratch up the surface of the soil so I can break down the barrier? That's a great question, Mark. So what Mark is saying, he's got... Uh, He's got some areas that are that he may want to seed in the spring. So I will just say this. If you have areas that are the size of a Volks, Volkswagen, <laughs> the size of a basketball or smaller, you probably won't need to seed those. Just bomb that puppy with nitrogen. Nitrogen drives the bus. Every, all the other elements right on that bus. Bomb it with nitrogen, and it should thicken up, especially if you have Kentucky bluegrass. That does get some rhizo rhizome activity. It can fill in a little quicker, but even fescues and rhizes, they get fat around the mother plant, and they can fill in an area the size of a basketball fairly quickly. So if they're bigger, though, if they are the size of a Volkswagen and you do have to seed, that's when you're going to want to go to liquid then because the liquid is controllable, right? You can, you can, it's the WDG formulation. It's a powder. You put it in water, you mix it up, now you spray a liquid. You can spray where you want the stuff and not spray where you don't. And those areas you can seed. Now, I would stay a good 18 to 24 inches away. So if this is your bare spot, I would stay 18 to 24 inches away from that with the liquid because it will get, you know, it can seep over. But if you stay a couple feet around it, you're going to be just fine. Then you can seed those areas. Just know that those areas may have some crabgrass breakthrough as well because you're going to be watering that seed a lot more, and that could stimulate some of that crabgrass seeds that are laying a little deep there. That's why, you know, if you have small bare spots, I would recommend against the seed. But excellent question. All right, Luke P. Luke is in Duxbury, Massachusetts. So half my lawn is full sun and half my lawn is mostly shade. And I get crabgrass in the sunny half and some poa in the shady half. My question is this, is there any reason to throw down prodiamine in the shady parts during spring, even when I don't get crabgrass over there? Or should I just do the sunny parts and then the shady parts in the fall for the poa? Thanks for the help. Good question. So yeah, he's right. Crabgrass is not going to grow in the shade, but it lives one year, it lives fast, and it dies hard. And so it's got to get all the sun it can, so you won't find it in shady areas. So I would say no, do not throw prodiamine or pre-emergent in areas that are shaded. There's no need to do it. Don't waste the chemical. This is being environmentally friendly. This is practicing integrated pest management. When I worked for True Green, we would tell our guys not to spray in areas that were full shade like that or mostly shade because you just don't need it. So that is a very good, I mean, you pretty much, you got it right, Luke. Now, for the poa, that's a different thing. Poa is like the exact opposite of crabgrass. It, it still germinates between the same window, but it germinates in the fall as soil temps fall below 70. And all during, all during the fall, as they fall to 55, that's its window. And so, yeah, you would want to put it in the shady spots in the fall to stop the poa. So, great question. 
All right, David G. David G. says, hey, Alan, I wanted to understand the reasoning behind the split application strategy with regards to pre-emergent. If you could explain a little better in the video, I'd appreciate it. Awesome, Dave. All right, so here's why I recommend the split application strategy. Think about painting a wall. Even if you buy one coat paint, when you paint a wall, you're still going to have areas where the paint is thin and you can kind of see through it, right? And that is exactly the same with the uh, pre-emergence. You're going to have areas that it just doesn't get perfect. The other thing is we're DIYers. We're not quite as experienced as pros. We don't have the same equipment. And so you might have overlap that isn't perfect in some places. You may, you know, have some areas that don't overlap at all where you missed or whatever that's going to happen. So by doing the split app, you do the first one and then you come back later with that second one as like that second coat of paint. And that just gives you a little bit of extra, um, it just covers up if you missed anything. It's kind of the idea. Like that second coat of paint just makes your paint job look better. The other thing that can happen there too is though, after the first application, what if you get a lot of foot traffic on the lawn or you get massive amounts of rain or you get, um, I don't know, whatever, something that breaks the barrier down. If you have that second app coming in, it again, it's just like that second bit of coverage that's really going to help you out and give you that extra uh, protection there. What I do recommend you do if you're going to do the two apps is if you, whether you're using granular or liquid, if you go east and west on the first application, go north and south on the second one. Now you're really covering. Now you're really hedging your bets and you're giving yourself excellent control, excellent coverage all the way around. So that's why I recommend the split application strategy, just putting an extra blanket on things. All right, Kyle K, Bertolus in Texas. Hey, Alan, here are my questions for your video. Is a certain active ingredient better than others depending on the app and turf type? He's got three questions. That's a good one. So let's talk about that. So we recommend, or I recommend prodiamine in the spring. Um, if you have dithiopyr, it's they're going to work about the same. The only difference is from my experience, prodiamine is going to work a little better in the spring when you have a lot more rain. It's going to stick a little bit better, but, but it's not going to probably be noticeable for most of you. So if you have dithiopyr or prodiamine, they're going to work about just the same. There are some other chemistries you can get that are pre-emergence that are going to work very well. But for the most part, prodiamine and or dithiopyr, but prodiamine is the most affordable, the most, most approachable, the easiest to put down, and we just know it works. So it's the gold standard. So that's why I just stick with it. It's just what we know works. It's tried and true. And, and again, it's, and it's easy to get, and it's not that expensive. Okay. Now, I will talk real quick here. I'll bring up the idea of the dithiopyr. So in the past, I would tell you guys, do prodiamine is your first app and dithiopyr is your second. And that's because that's what we did at True Green. But I was talking to Matt Martin a couple of years and he reminded me of something and, and I, and it had just something I just didn't think about when the reason we wreck, I would typically, oh, I don't go back to this. The reason I would say use dithiopyr as the second application is because it's the later application and dithiopyr does have some post-emergence control on young crabgrass. So if you did have a few escapees and, or you were late with your crabgrass pre-emergent, maybe you found this video really late. It's like late May in Indiana and you still wanted to put a pre-emergent down, soil temps were still there, you would use dithiopyr because if there are any escapees, it can have some post-emergence control on them. And that is true. But what Matt told me is, Alan, it's got to be liquid for that to happen. You don't get it with the granular. And so I thought about that. And I'm like, he's right. Because when you're, when you're trying to kill something post-emergent, you want to coat the leaf with a liquid. It has to stick to the leaf of that, in this case, crabgrass, in order to kill it. If you're using the granular, it's going into the soil right? So therefore, you do not get the post-emergent control when you use dithiopyr granular. And he corrected me on that. And the thing about that is you can't really get an inexpensive dithiopyr liquid. Go look. You, it's one of those where you got to pay a couple hundred bucks for a gallon, I think, for the most part. Now, it'll, it'll last you a long time, but it's, it's just one of those that's just not going to work out there. So I kind of abandoned that application strategy where I went from prodiamine to dithiopyr because of that, because if you're using granulars, you don't get that added benefit. So I just wanted to correct that for some of you guys that are more advanced. So uh, Kyle asks, are there any good pre-emergent options for budget warriors? So I would say, Kyle, that uh, prodiamine is the budget. Um, let's just do some math here. So we have uh, the 45 pound bag of prodiamine and that prodiamine that covers 15,000 square feet. So uh, let's just say you had a 5,000 square foot lawn. If you had a 5,000 square foot lawn, 55 divided by three, that's $18.33 per application. So if you had a 5,000 square foot lawn and you wanted to apply the prodiamine granular, your first app would cost you uh, $18.33 and your second application will cost you $18.33. I would say that's pretty budget conscious. I mean, I know that could be different for everybody, 
But I can tell you if you're hiring a professional, they will never show up to your lawn for $18. No professional in the world will even show up for $18. Bucks. They're, you're looking at $45 or $50 for a 5,000 square foot lawn, maybe more. So I think what you got to do when you look at budget is don't look at what does the bag cost me. It's like, what does it cover and how big is my lawn? You know, if you have a 7,500 square foot lawn, you could get two applications out of one bag. If you have a 5,000 square foot lawn, you get three applications out of one bag. So something to think about when it comes to budget conscience. It's really conscious. It's really about doing a little bit of extra math there. Third one, is it possible to have a weed-free lawn if you're a weekend warrior? Yes, for sure. For sure it is. Do, DIY is always cheaper than hiring a pro. And, um, you know, mowing is really the most important thing that you can do, and mowing is free besides the gas. So if you can get the mowing right, I think you can do really well. All right, let's go now. Hey, Jim, Jim over in St. Pete, where I was born and raised. Alan, I'm getting ready to till up and get rid of my salad bar in March, and I'm going to put down St. Augustine sod floratam. Is it wise to hit the soil with pre-emergent before I lay the sod? If not, how soon after can I install and put it down? So that's a great question, Jim. So the answer is no, no pre-emergent prior to sodding. You want those roots to be able to live fat and happy. And because you're doing St. Augustine, you can see some, uh, sometimes the stolons won't be able to tack down if there is prodiamine in there. So do not apply pre-emergent to a new sodded area. And you want to wait at least one full year, not a full season, one full year, because in St. Petersburg, you're year round. So one full year. Let me just say, if you're somebody that has cool season turf and you sodded, you don't have to wait a full year. You just need to wait through one winter. Cool season turf is different. It's going to root down in the fall. It's going to harden itself off so it can handle the winter. And once a new sodded lawn has handled the winter, then you can apply pre-emergent to a cool season lawn the next spring. So warm season turf, all of you guys, because our ground doesn't freeze in most places where there is warm season turf. If you have warm season turf and you're going to sod, no pre-emergent before and no pre-emergent for one full year. If you have cool season turf, no pre-emergent before and no pre-emergent until it's gone through at least one winter. Those are my recommendations there. Great question. Keith over in Orlando. If I'm planning on doing a complete lawn renovation and laying down new so zoysia sod, would it be beneficial to lay down a pre-emergent before the renovation? That's kind of the same question I just had. So uh, Keith, yeah, no, no pre-emergent. So that's pretty funny. Those two came up at the same time. Okay. We got William E. over in Charleston, South Carolina. Alan, here is my question. I planted centipede sod last fall and I held off on any pre-emergent. I thought I would let the sod go one growing season before applying any pre-ems. I don't want to harm the sod. Should I skip it? Wow, that's the same question again. <laughs> oh, man, I need to go through these a little bit better. So no, no, not for a full year, my friend. Okay, all right, Tim L. from Lockmar Larkmont, New York. I wanted to ask this coming spring, if I aerate my lawn and then apply pre-emergent, is that okay? Reason I ask is I heard that aerating in the lawn is good to allow the grass to have better access to water and fertilizer, but at the same time, I want to keep the weeds away. Good question. So what Tim is asking is, hey, can I aerate in the springs that can affect the pre-emergent? I'm going to recommend no aeration in the spring. The reason I'm going to say that is because outside of even pre-emergent, you're disturbing the soil at a time when you're getting a lot of rain in the spring and um, a lot of weeds are trying to grow, not just crabgrass, but dandelions and many others are trying to grow in the spring so they can make it through the summer there. And by stirring everything up, you're helping them. So I would say no. Now, when it comes to the crabgrass, same thing. You're going to, you're going to probably pull up a lot of the crabgrass seeds that were maybe there that maybe dropped or whatever. You're going to open them up to more heat, more water, more of this, more of that. And on top of that, your, your pre-emergent, even if you put it down after the aeration, it's not going to cover as well because those holes are open, open and, and it can disturb the barrier even after. So you definitely don't aerate on top of your pre-emergent, but you don't want to put pre-emergent down after the aeration for the same reason. It's just, you just don't. You don't want to disturb the ground in the spring if you can help it. So if you're concerned, I mean, I, I treated lawns in Indiana and Illinois and even into Ohio that were just complete clay, and we never really had problem with water penetration in spring because the ground is fairly saturated after all the snow anyway, and it's soft, and as well as all the rain. So there's plenty of penetration going there. And then if you uh, do want to get additional penetration, we have the liquid aerate product that that's exactly what that does. It increases water penetration. And as water penetrates the soil, it's going to pull down nutrients. It's going to pull down uh, carbon and other things. So I would just say hold off on the mechanical aeration in the spring for sure. And if you're concerned about it, use the liquid aerate. Great question. Kevin C. Allen, I'm out of dithiop here and prodiamine. And my soil temps here in Texas have just been hovering around the 55 mark. I do have some pennant magnum that I bought to control my rescue grass problem, and it worked great for that. Can I use it as a full-on replacement for one of my dithiapyr or perdiamine apps? Yes, you can. 
Um, you can use both if you want to. And in fact, on the label, you can actually tank mix them. But if you want to use that pennant magnum as a replacement for those, you can because it'll stop crabgrass and many, many other things. It's one of those more expensive ones that is newer chemistry and it works great for warm season turf only. All right, Dwight. Dwight says, I'm stationed in Jacksonville, Florida. Thank you for your service, my brother. I was actually going to ask this in the group, but it would be amazing if it could be addressed in your videos. Question, between the granular yard mastery prodiamine and the 65WG that you mix in water, what's the key difference? And what would you use one over the other? I ask because it seems that the water-soluble water one is cheaper and you get more square footage out of it. That's a great question. Very good question. Who raw? Rah. So I'm assuming you're Navy over there, over there in Jacksonville. So I wrote an article, and I will put that below, that shows you the difference in the granular and the liquid. But in long and the short of it is, they work the same. The one that you should use is the one that you are most comfortable with. If you're more comfortable applying granular, you should use that. If you're more comfortable applying liquid, you should use that. Advantages go, you can control a liquid much easier. You know, your spreader's throwing prills out in the granular. It's harder to control. It's not hard, but it's harder. Whereas a liquid goes right where you spray it like painting, right? So that's easier. The other thing with the liquid, you can tank mix other products in there. You can throw some RGS in there with it and get a get an app done together. Um, all pre, all pre-emergents need to be watered in to get into the soil. However, a liquid is by nature a smaller particle. And by the way, the WDG formulation, it doesn't dissolve in the water. It's just a suspension in the water. Um, so you need to keep it agitated, but once it gets down, it's a smaller particle. So watering it down, it falls into the soil much quicker. So that's an advantage there. Um, price wise, I'll go ahead. I'm not going to be able to do the costing here for you, but I'll take a break here and I'll do the costing for you now. Right, here's another one. This one comes from Greg, and he's in San Antonio, Texas. Hey, Alan, should we be alternating pre-emergence like we do with fungicide, Disease X, and BioAdvanced, for example? I have the prodiamine 65WD, WDG. Should we mix it up like Dimension Dithiopyr or other pre-emergence so the weeds don't become resistant? Wow, good question, Greg. This is a good one. So first thing is uh, Dithiopyr and uh, prodiamine are the same group uh, chemical class mode of action. So mixing those up doesn't stop resistance. But yes, things, I think some POA anua has become resistant to uh, some of these. So the answer is you should mix them up. But but when I say that, let me, let me tell it to you a different way. What you can actually do is stop using them. So this kind of goes into a question that I get a lot of, and it's, Alan, do I have to put down crabgrass control or prodiamine every single year? The answer is no. For the most part, typically speaking, once you have kept crabgrass out of your lawn for three to four years, you probably won't need to use prodiamine anymore. You can stop. Now, listen, I sell prodiamine. I, I mean, it'd behoove me to tell you that you have to use it every year for 20 years, right? But that's not the case. Once once you get eradicate the problem, there's there's no more seeds in the, in the soil or there are very few, you're not going to have an issue. And any that do break through, you can just spot spray them. So I wouldn't worry about the resistance piece of it. What I would just do is after you keep the problem at bay for three or four years, just stop. Okay. So that that's environmentally friendly too. That's integrated pest management. Now, what can happen though, because crabgrass seeds can sit in the soil for many years. And so you might have some buried deep forgotten and you get a, a year that's like a hundred year flood that sits in your lawn and saturates the lawn or whatever. And then you'll have a crabgrass problem. That can happen. But if that happens, then you just go to using prodiamine for a couple more years again to eradicate that new problem and then stop again. 
So that's really the strategy that I recommend. So it isn't really about rotating uh, active ingredients, which is good thinking, Greg. It's really just more about using it for three to four years and then just stop, save the money, and you don't have to use it anymore. So great question. I'm glad we addressed that one. All right, I think this video is gonna get pretty long. You can see I have a whole bunch more here and a whole bunch that I didn't even get to. Um, but I wanted to, to address one thing, and that is hot zones. So some folks have asked, and this came in several different questions. They're like, Alan, you know, I got an area in my park strip or my parkway or along the driveway where the concrete is that gets really bad crabgrass every year, and it comes up much earlier. And that is because that's a heat zone, right? That's where sun hits that concrete, radiates out, so those areas heat up faster. But on And so the crabgrass germinates sooner. But on top of that, those are also areas that maybe get more foot traffic, people getting in and out of cars, stepping on the lawn, breaks a barrier. Uh, also, your weed whacking, or if you use a blade edger, that will break the barrier. Also, it isn't like the prodiamine barrier, you know, runs right up to the sidewalk and sticks to it. It doesn't do that. So those areas will always have breakthrough. Now, if people ask, should I apply heavier in those areas? And the answer is, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. But what you might want to do is, number one, hit those areas earlier around the edges. And this is where using a liquid and a granular strategy might come in better because liquid, again, easier to control like around an edge. So if you know you got all the edges you know, the, your, your, you know, your soil temp in the, in the hole of the lawn is typically going to hit 50 to 55, you know, say, I don't know, whatever, like April, April 1st, wherever you live. Well, but the areas around the heat zones might be two or three weeks ahead of that. So you go out and you spray liquid around the edges, right? That two or three weeks ahead of time and just target those areas. That's one strategy. The other one would be though, if you do apply granular, you know, you get some in your driveway, you know, some squirts off, it gets in the driveway, it gets in the sidewalk, we'll sweep that back in and sweep that right along the edges to kind of hedge those areas. That's another way to do it. So I'm not telling you to go spray heavy, go off label, but for sure, put your, put your extra granules that went on this driveway because you don't want to leave them there. Sweep those around those edges for sure or use that liquid strategy. But that's kind of a way to start working. And then the other thing is, obviously, you know those are hot zones. You know they're going to have breakthrough. So be ready with your quinclorac ahead of time. Have that mixed up early and get on that crabgrass when it's young so it's a much easier to kill and much faster. So there you go. I think we'll probably have to go through and do this again because I have so many questions that came in here, so many good ones. And uh, so we'll see what kind of reaction you guys have below, what you like about it, what you didn't. If you have more questions, please leave those below. I'll try to answer a few of those in the comments as well. Great to have you guys interacting in the comments. So with that, I'm probably putting this out on Super Bowl Sunday. So I don't really watch football, even though I live like 20 minutes from, is it still called Raymond James Stadium? <laughs> Raymond James Field? I don't know. I live like 20 minutes from there, but I don't really care about sports. But I, I'll watch the game, obviously. Uh, but I'll mostly be watching it because I like the commercials. So with that, I hope you guys have a great week. And I'll see you in the long